Global macro hedge fund managers typically hold outright directional long and short positions in contrast to relative value and arbitrage strategies. They've also been known to patiently hold cash while awaiting opportunities. Geopolitical events and macroeconomic trends in growth or inflation usually drive their outlook on market direction and timing, rather than micro events such as company specific earnings revisions or credit downgrades. Regulatory, fiscal, and monetary policy shifts, and sometimes wars or natural disasters, can cause abrupt changes in global economies. These changes impact interest rates, currencies, commodities, and equity markets, but they can especially impact risk and liquidity premiums. Surging liquidity premiums can send many market participants rushing for the exit door, often for non-economic reasons such as forced liquidation, and thus overshooting expected equilibrium levels. These explosive inflection points in the markets occur irregularly, but they are the hunting grounds of global macro hedge funds. Their portfolios can be quite diversified, but sometimes they're highly concentrated in just a handful of positions, and they typically use leverage and derivatives to amplify their expected profits. Some invest only in developed countries, while others invest in emerging markets. Some express trades using individual equities and cash bonds, but most only trade equity, indices, or benchmark futures. Global macro is a rather well-publicized strategy, despite the fact that the vast majority of hedge funds are not global macro hedge funds. One reason for this is that while most arbitrage and long-short equity uh, managers are comparatively secretive about their portfolios, especially regarding their short positions, some macro managers have spoken candidly about their positions and investment rationale, confident that the superior liquidity of their underlying markets, for example, a G7 currency trade, shielded them from a short squeeze. Some notable macro managers have also publicly challenged monetary and fiscal policies, perhaps hoping to be a catalyst in the markets. But mostly, global macro hedge fund managers have been well known for making big leverage bets with big returns. Most investors expect the volatility of global macro hedge funds to be very high, with risk-adjusted returns roughly similar to long-short equity hedge funds over the long run. But the expected correlation of global macro hedge funds to other investment strategies is pretty low, typically below 20%. The strategy has seen some extreme asset flows over the years, sometimes concentrated in just a handful of hedge funds, such as the record outflows in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Last year, however, following very good absolute and relative performance for the strategy, and perhaps sensing diminished opportunity sets in other hedge fund strategies, <clears throat> investors flowed back into global macro hedge funds at a record pace. Given the recent asset flows and investor interest in the strategy, and the current macroeconomic and geopolitical uncertainty, and the myriad possible ways to express their views in the markets, I know that our panelists have a lot of light to shed on today's topic. Right? Um, it just, just occurs to me that <clears throat> if, if that's a global hit macro, I don't, I understand that's the generalization of the over, all global macro. I don't want to be it <laughs> because what uh, you painted is a picture of a few big bets leveraged up on a macroeconomic outlook. And just to try to comp describe what we are, we're about, um, I guess, 60% related to a macroeconomic outlook and 40% everything that we think will work. And so the way I think that we, we all manage money in one form or another is to create return streams, all different return streams. And the best way to create return streams is to have things where you have your core competency. And so we have some core competency in the, those big liquid markets and we're, um, as well as other markets. And, um, but to create a, a batch of a portfolio of uncorrelated return streams. And so if you're making big bets, big concentrated bets in anything, or concentrated bets in anything, if you took an arbitrage strategy and there's one bet, and you take that bet and you leverage it up and it's one bet, you can't be ever good enough in any limited number of bets not to run into a serious trouble. So I suspect that probably um, the direction is changing. I think it's interesting 
<clears throat> that there are these categories of investments. So the, invest the hedge fund world is involving in a, in a way where there now there are all these different styles of investing, and the average correlation of the managers in each one of those styles. Um, I think uh, Tremont Partners says, you know, I don't know, a dozen or 15. We ran the average correlations of those. Has a correlation of something like 50 to 60 percent in each one of those styles of the average manager to the average other manager in that style. And what that means is that um, that rather than producing alpha for the most part, that core return is a systematic bias, a beta of some form that is not alpha. And that that represents, I think, a problem. Anyway, just to sort of describe what we are. <clears throat> uh, founded the firm 28 years ago, and um, we've always managed money for institutions. And then about 14 years ago, <clears throat> we put, uh, put together a hedge fund product, which was to take all of the best bets and organize it in the best possible way, best portfolio bets. And so we manage about $8 billion under that strategy, and it's a highly diversified strategy. And so I'm coming at our topic today uh, from the perspective of dealing with institutions. And I think what's going on there is interesting and it will affect the flow, so I just want to touch on it a bit. Um, the key to successful investing is, is 15 or more good uncorrelated return streams. That's what we're all after, right? If you, because when you have 15 or more good uncorrelated return streams, what happens is your risk is reduced by about 80%. And that means your information ratio or your sharp ratio, your return to risk ratio, increases by a factor of five. And there's nothing that you can do in making any single decision that much better <clears throat> to get an information ratio of a factor of five. So when you're thinking about structuring your portfolio, and institutional investors are thinking about structuring their portfolio, they will be driven, in order to get a certain good return, they will be driven to something like as many good uncorrelated return streams. And so what you're seeing in institutions right now is that they're learning that lesson because they had a concentration in equities. 70% of their, uh, typically 70% of their assets, about 95% of their risk is in equities. One, what they believe good uncorrelated return stream. And with the development of leverage and so on, what they're looking for is good, high returning uncorrelated return streams. Because with interest rates, what they are, they're unable to deliver <coughs> Uh, the adequate returns. And so you're seeing money come into hedge funds by institutions at a very fast rate. That's what's behind that kind of movement. And <clears throat> another thing that's happening is that there's a separation of alpha and beta. So you think of hedge funds probably as an asset class. Now, the way to think about investing is there are asset classes, we'll call betas, Let's call made of stocks or as an asset class. Bonds is an asset class. You can, value, you can invest in those passively. You don't need an active management, and it'll produce a certain kind of return stream. And then there's alphas that um, are value-added, and they'll produce a different return stream. And when you're constructing a portfolio of alphas and betas, which is what your portfolio turns out to be, this mix of how much do I want to have in an asset class and how much do I want to have in, a, in an alpha, that that mix that you put together, your portfolio will be just a weighted average of those mixes, and that they ha and you have to say, make those decisions. But alpha and betas are very different. And so where we used to invest in a way where there was the investment in an asset class, let's say you'd say, I'm going to invest in equities, I'm going to give it in, to an equity manager to make money. And so that slice of the pie would be equities and equity managers with alpha and beta together. We're changing that the way we're investing so that there are portfolios of alphas and portfolios of asset classes and betas. And now portable alpha and hedge funds are competing, will evolve to compete. And so what is a hedge fund? A hedge fund <clears throat> is nothing more than the alphas, its alphas, mixed within with some betas. In other words, there are systematic biases. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these high correlations with those asset classes. There are systematic biases that exist that can make it subject to a certain environment, and that, that, and that there are these mix of alphas and betas, and that's how it's approached. And so those two worlds are coming together to create one world of alpha producers. Okay, And so people in the hedge fund world, you could take a hedge fund, all, all that hedge fund really is, is pretty much leveraged alpha. They take an alpha 
and then they choose to magnify that alpha, in a sense, you, through the use of leverage. You could take um, an alpha that's produced by a traditional manager. You could hedge away that manager's exposure. You could apply leverage, and you could gear that up. And so more engineering is occurring that way, and that's the way money's managed. And so the worlds are coming together. Those traditional worlds are coming together, the alpha overlay and the hedge fund, and you're just going to look for managers who can produce alpha, and your goal is to separate alpha and beta. Then how a manager chooses to go about doing that is really up to him, and I think it's just return streams. And so there's nothing too much fundamentally different in, in, um, in global macro in some ways other than, you know, there are those general rules. Global macro, macro used to be the, the cowboy who would come in and say, I, the gunslinger, who would say, uh, bet on this and bet on that and that, and I'll have a few bets, and no bet can ever be good enough that it's going to produce a high enough information ratio that you're not going to get in trouble. So you, have, you need diverse, diversification. So now when we think about um, how you produce that, all value added is zero sum. So for a ma manager to add value, he has to take it away from another ma manager. That's very different from beta. Beta, you know, if you invest in stocks in a standard way, you'll have an excess return relative to cash. There will be an excess return with a low information ratio. If you <coughs> invest in um, alpha, you better pick the right alpha. And so what it really comes down to in all forms of alpha is that the smart will take money away from the dumb. It's just basic, just like any other business. So it's zero sum and we're the smart. So we concentrate. We need to focus in order to compete in this game. It's like competing in the Olympics. It's more difficult than competing in the Olympics. Yet everybody has an opinion in this game. It's, but to compete effectively, you have to focus. And so we choose to focus, and for 28 years we've chosen to focus on the credit and currency markets, and then we create uncorrelated bets. So how do you structure those uncorrelated bets? You structure those correlated bets by taking a lot of spreads. That's, by and large, what we do. And I think that when you're looking at managers and you're looking at global macro, <clears throat> one thing is that I think you do need a little bit of uh, a macro view because the fact that the average asset class is the average hedge fund manager within that asset class is 50 to 60 percent correlated with each other. And you could take those return streams. We took each of those return streams and we plotted those return streams for each asset class. And each of those return streams for each asset class follows something that's uh, very closely related to an underlying bias, an underlying beta. So, for example, if you took the average return stream of merger arbitrage managers and you replicated that by just taking all the mergers and, taking the comp and going along those that are being acquired, and short those that are acquiring, take those spreads, plot those return streams on top of each other, they're identical. If you take um, emerging market debt managers and you take the credit spreads of emerging market debt and you plot those things on, on top of each other, they're identical. So a lot of these things are being driven by what will determine whether that, mer that merger arbitrage uh, goes through and becomes a good strategy. Well, the environment. If you have an environment in which the deals fall apart, and so on, then that'll go out. And if you have an environment where they come together, then that'll be good. So that there are so many systematic biases which uh, are reflected in marketplaces. Those systematic biases are not alphas. And over a period of time, um, they may have a little bit of an excess return, but they're going to be driven by uh, what the characteristics of the environment are. And so almost all strategies will be influenced by the characteristics. So you have to know something about what the characteristics of the environment are, I think. And then you um, also, I think, from an engineering point of view, have to separate alpha and beta. So anyway, our mission is to have, in one form or another, they don't have to be macro, 60% are macro or so, 40% are non-macro, just inefficiencies that we have. But the greatest portfolio of inefficiencies so that I have, we must have, 15 or more, in our case we try to have literally 150 or more, uh, uh, different uncorrelated return streams which come from alphas um, so that there's no concentrator of risk and never uh, leverage. And so when I think about some of the things that you're saying, I think that that's some of the problems that symptomatic of some of the problems that have been in, go in, in global macro. And I, I guess I just wanted to get out those thoughts. Thank you. Marie? Yeah. Renee? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here today. 
Um, last week when Bill and Steve uh, hosted the conference call to give the overall heads up on what was expected of us here um, at the breakfast, one phrase uh, repeatedly stuck in my mind. Um, in a way, we are reviving the lost art of storytelling. Great, I thought. A raconteur's breakfast. I love hearing and telling stories. So prior to my incantations on global macro, methodology, and market views, I would like to tell a story. Um, from age 3 to 13, I lived in the local jail. My father was the sheriff. And um, this is one of his stories. Um, and I will leave it up to you to decipher if this has anything to do with global macro. I think it has everything and nothing, but I'll leave it up to you. So uh, please bear with me for the first three to five minutes of my uh, 10 to 15 minutes um, for the story. Far enough, said a man standing near the far end of the room with his back to the wall. I didn't heed his advice, and I walked a few steps farther. The man, about five foot ten, wearing a long black waistcoat, a white shirt, and a brown tweed trousers, crouched slightly with his wrist bent back at an angle near his hips and spread his fingers wide apart. I'm Jesse James, he said. When I count three, we draw and shoot. His eyes were steady, and I noticed a bulge in his waistcoat near his right hip. I stopped my advance. Damn, I said to myself, I've done it again, gotten careless and gotten myself into big trouble. Wait a minute, I said, while mentally kicking myself for not even remembering his first name. I don't have a weapon. I didn't. I'll have to go and get one if we're going to have a shootout. So I turned towards the archway. Don't move or I draw, the man said, and began parting his waistcoat with his right hand. I knew I couldn't make it to the archway if he had a gun. I was in the middle of the room with no place to go, but perhaps to my grave. I decided the closer I could get to him, the better off I'd be. I was six feet from him when he drew I managed to grab his wrist just before he fired from the 12-inch green candle he'd pulled from his pants pocket. Jesse and I got on quite well on the way to the jailhouse, where I put him away to await his hearing. Helen and I were polishing off the last of the Swedish meatballs and gravy from our noon meal when a knock on the dumbwaiter summoned me to the jail, where by now Jesse had transformed himself into a seafarer. He'd stopped up the floor drain in the washroom and turned on the water faucets. The sink was overflowing, and he leaned on a mop handle, swaying to the wash of an imaginary wave in a stormy sea. Later that afternoon, after leaving my man, who had reverted to being Jesse again at the Rochester State Hospital, I decided that I deserved a bit of stress relief. I chose the pinnacle room of the Kaler Hotel, which overlooked the male medical complex. A sheriff's duties bring him into contact with many characters, and some of his colleagues are a match for even the most unique of them. One of these, Willis, Willis Fryer, the sheriff at Dodge County, a snooze-chewing, whiskey-drinking curmudgeon's curmudgeon, called to me as I entered the pinnacle room. Neil, come on over. Sit down. I'll buy you a drink. Willis intoned in a voice tarnished by drink. He sat, slouched in a corner booth, accompanied by a white-bearded companion. They both appeared to have been imbibing for quite some time. I slid into the booth beside Willis. Shake hands with my friend Ernie, Willis said. Pleased to meet you, Ernie. I'm Neil Haugert, I said, extending my hand across the table. I met Ernie here at lunch, Willis said. I glanced at the clock behind the bar. It was five o'clock. I had my drink and found the conversation at a level that would have made more sense, perhaps, if I'd been drinking with the boys since noon. I had a second drink and listened for another 20 minutes, during which time, in order to make conversation, I asked, What's your last name, Ernie? Hemingway, he said. Yeah, right, Ernie, I replied. How fitting for my day, I thought. I bring Jesse James to the state hospital and have happy hour with Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> it gave me a chuckle as I bade my colleague and newfound friend goodbye. The following day after dinner, in the comfort of our living room, I scanned the evening paper while simultaneously watching the television. My attention became more focused on the paper when I saw an article with a picture that resembled Ernie, Willis's friend. The article explained that Ernest Hemingway was being cared for at the St. Mary's Hospital and had been observed downtown occasionally when excused from care. Hey, Helen, I said. I guess I did have happy hour with Ernest Hemingway. If only I had known. 
<laughs> so if only I had known. And I think it does have everything and nothing to do with global macro. So that being said, um, I would like to address three major issues today, I guess. Why global macro and why commodities? Um, Galtier is a, a heavily based, a hybrid commodity global macro fund. Two, um, what, is, what is Galtier's methodology with this global macro commodity hybrid? What enables us to capitalize on the macroeconomic trends and dislocations? And number three, what are our current market views? I would like to reemphasize regarding the global macro, that global macro is not just an investment strategy. Far from it. Um, more importantly, it is a thought process in today's world of increasing globalization and economic synchronicity. It is incumbent upon all asset managers, whether trading equities, bonds, real estate, or commodities, to understand the impact of global events and the interrelationships of all asset classes on market motivation and momentum. So why commodities? Since early in 2002, actually we could even see evidence of it in um, 2000, and it was derailed by, uh, in late 2000, but it was derailed uh, by uh, 911 in 2001. Commodities as an asset class have left their two decade long malaise far behind them. Increasingly, the global, ac the global economic environment is becoming characterized by supply shortages due to unforeseen events and surges in demand due to the emerging importance of new players in world commodity markets. While weather patterns, <coughs> conflicts, and political dislocations have always been with us, the advent of new demand from the explosive Chinese economy has upset the balance of a number of markets in a more permanent way. Our belief is that only an investment approach which is truly global in its scope and truly all-encompassing in its uh, armory of an investment vehicles will equip the sophisticated investor with the tools she or he needs to take on the challenge of tomorrow's financial markets. What's our methodology? How do we profitably traverse the global landscape? Well, as Alfred North Whitehead quipped once, we think in generalities, but we live in the details. And that's exactly what we do. And as Ray and Dan both mentioned, that the, you know, the past hist history of uh, global macro being the gunslinger, it, we, we are, as a group, I think a far cry from that. And I think, as both of them mentioned as well, the individual manager searching for alpha and staying true to their style is imperative. Um, very simply, we, we capitalize on Galtier. We've put a, um, our style of trading is we've, tried to capitalize on the best of both the discretionary and systematic world, so to speak. Our theme-based methodology combines discretionary fundamental analysis to determine portfolio, composition, and direction with two, a rigorous non-discretionary system of value pricing, entry, exit, and risk of all investments or trades. How specifically do we accomplish this? Our investment approach begins with a global overview, a snapshot of the world encompassing an assessment of the broadest range of factors, from geopolitics to weather patterns, from interest rates and asset prices to demographics and trade agreements. Following from the top-down overview, a series of themes <coughs> is identified and evaluated. The fund will ultimately take positions in three to five themes at any given time and 5 to 15 investments within each theme, mirroring, I guess, exactly what uh, Dan and Ray have said on this. Uh, within each theme, we look for 15 different uncorrelated um, revenue streams as well. Examples of current themes in um, Galtier's approach are commodities from a supply and demand scenario, precious metals, free trade area of the Americas um, economic convergence, and an economic theory that I've uh, referred to as inverse stagflation. In addition, we selectively participate in special events with particular investment potential. And again, this is trading around our core position, trading against our long-term views, as Dan mentioned, um, basically being willing to take shorter-term <coughs> trades that may go against your core positions to further enhance your yield or your revenue streams. 
Examples from the past included Japanese monetary policy deflation with the potential for reflationary action by the BOJ or devaluation of the yen or the zero um, interest rate policy that Japan recently pushed out to the 10-year area. Of course, now with the bond market moves, that, is, that has changed. But it was a, um, a very special situation and, and you, you, could, you did, were able to identify it coming. Our precious metals themes noted that global supply and demand forces started contracting as early as 1999 and continues today, with the short carry trade and safe haven currency aspects of gold adding fuel to the price fire. Once these themes have been identified and appropriate asset classes and investments within asset classes have been selected, our strategy turns to the identification of technical value zones for systematic technical value zones for entry and exit. Each position is initiated using a proprietary technical system which I've developed over the past two decades of trading. Once established, positions are then subjected to a rigorous risk management system using fixed percentage levels to control losses, both with respect to individual trades and by theme. These are the details. The generalities in raconteur terms, well, that's easy. We build three to five silos that we fill up with five to 15 investments, several different grains, trade around the core position, and then empty the silo to make way for the next opportunity. Now to the fun part. What are we looking for in 2004? Um, basically, we still see that global macro is definitely on the rise and will play an increasingly important role across all asset classes. Equities alone in the near term and possibly even long term cannot play the role they have played in the past. Investors who stay in equities alone because of past performance and who use the 1993-2000 as their benchmark, the seven years of plenty, may be in for a rude awakening. And in fact, our, our proprietary technical system, which does not signify or trigger composition or direction, but it is getting into, if we were to look at the uh, equities as an asset class, it is signaling a short-term overvaluation, whether this is um, just a, uh, a bump in this last year's rally or, um, or a top is, uh, is yet to be seen. And again, diversifying among equities alone will not yield as positive a return as diversifying among asset classes and themes. Um, number three, investment in selective commodities and global macro themes represent the best opportunity for capturing value, both from the long and the short side. And we like to think about the basics, what makes sense, the real things, food, agricultural products, grains, gold, natural gas, and even farmland. Um, we have views as well with the, mad, the recent uh, mad cow and do think that um, there is going to be the export of bands are going to, uh, import bands are going to last a little bit longer than people expect and that um, this is one area of commodities that it has come off, it's significantly off its highs and rallies should be shown, sold for the time being. So that is one area as well to offset the overall bullish nature of our commodity view. Um, number four, the free trade area convergence of North American economies um, will continue to converge. And it's really much like what happened in Europe in um, 1994. It will just take longer to happen and be more selective. And I agree with um, the aspects that Dan mentioned as well, that the, uh, the carry um, that you have to play to be long the dollar against many of these currencies is um, negative and, and to be short to be long these currencies. Um, gives you a good cushion to, uh, um, to take that view. Um, also, there are, um, in some of these currencies, I mean, right now we have the Czech Republic rates. If you look at the 10 lowest yields in the world, you actually have Czech rates and um, um, below the Euro rates. And there may have been some overshooting in the, in the Euro land uh, of convergence, and the overshooting of convergence will rebalance as well. Um, number five, um, inverse stagflation and the weight of money theory, we believe, will cap mid-curve interest rates. And even though we are entering on an inflationary period um, and with current account deficits and budget deficits exacerbating that, we believe the weight of money theory with demographics um, 
yields in the 10-year area, 5 to 10-year, 7 to 10-year area, 4.5 to 5% represent good value. However, stay out of the long end, as with current deficits and ballooning spending programs, the 1030s curve should steepen even further. And while we don't see the Fed raising rates anytime soon within the next uh, couple of quarters, um, when inflation and or um, employment levels pick up, we think the bulk of the rate increases will come in the shape of a yield curve change, more V-shaped or backward L-shaped, with the mid-curve rates possibly even capped below the rate of inflation if inflation rates accelerate in the extreme. Um, so, in short, the time has come for a new mindset for global investment thought leaders. The markets of the past 12 months have borne out the resurgent potential of commodities and the reinforcing power of correctly tailored currency and interest rate exposures. The global macro investor is in the right markets with the right instruments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me to the Greenwich Roundtable. I'm happy to be here to give a crash course on how to buy a <laughs> macro hedge fund in 10 minutes or less. <laughs> Although I have more experience as a hedge fund manager than as an investor in different funds, having worked for Julian Robertson, Michael Steinhardt, and Steve Cohen, I've seen enough variation in money management styles to have a sense as to what you as investors should be looking for in a good global macro hedge fund manager. From my perspective, everything begins with the anomalous viewpoint. Can your prospective manager come up with something that is not commonly understood or known? Steinhardt used to call this the variant perception. He used to say to me, what do you know, Dan, that the rest of the world does not? Where is your edge? These are different ways of saying, how is your idea not currently discounted by the market? What piece of data, what thought, what worldview do you have that gives you the comfort to hold a long or short position in whatever market? Deep macroanalytical research is usually the only way to come up with something original. The more work one does, the better the results. I've never known a lazy macro hedge fund manager, lazy successful macro hedge fund manager. An original idea that could serve as the cornerstone of a bet can come from anywhere. The idea can be sparked by a piece of economic data, by a chart or technical pattern, by an expectation of a geopolitical shift, or a combination of these three things or something else entirely. The idea usually emanates from something that surprises, from some data point that you think says something different about the world than is currently discounted by the market. Once one has some faith in the anomalous idea, it serves as the bedrock for medium-term macro fundamental view, which for me is usually a three- to six-month view. In some cases, the view can be as long as a year. However, after you've done all this work to come up with your idea, it is important to realize that it does not have any value in and of itself. This, this I'll explain in a minute. One thing to watch out for when choosing a macro hedge fund manager is the guy who only talks about ideas. This is the pontificator, and he will get you into trouble because for him the interest in the process is the idea rather than the return on capital. It is important to sense in a manager that he sees the idea as an aid in helping him purchase something at one to sell at four. In the macro game, ideas can be very seductive because they can be so all-encompassing and universal. The seduction of the idea can lead a manager to hold positions through treacherous volatility, and in some unfortunate cases, we all remember 1994, force some managers into positions where their businesses are compromised. So, once one, has, once one has arrived at a place where one has faith in one's anomalous macro view, it is imperative that the manager has some catalyst for, for the market to act upon. As I said before, the idea is only relevant in that it helps you buy at one and sell at four. Similarly, the idea itself can only be transmitted into a financial position after one can foresee a set of data points or events coming up in the near future, anywhere from one to two months or sooner, for instance, that will force the market to see what you are currently envisioning. This is so important because without some catalyst, the macro manager can sit waiting for months and sometimes years for a position to play out. This is certainly no way to optimize return on capital and will spread the energies too thin. If the macro manager tells you that he has an idea but no near-term catalyst, this should also be a warning flag that he isn't on top of his game in the way that he should be. You don't want your macro manager, like some of the gold bug managers, sitting with a long gold position in 1997 at $350, saying the market is going to 400 a correct assessment in retrospect which took six years to play out. Not a good way to maximize return. 
So, so far we have an anomalous view, a catalyst, a time horizon, and an expectation for the payoff. However, all of this ends up being irrelevant to the money-making process if the manager does not have a very well-defined risk management process, whereby each trade in the portfolio has specifically set risk parameters and performance expectations over time. The risk management of the trade is equally important to the first part of the process. Any macro manager that does not have a well-thought-out approach should be careful, carefully reconsidered. The most important thing to look for on the risk side is consistency of approach and method. Without it, there can be no success. One skill that is valuable in the risk management process is the ability to trade on a shorter time horizon, often a time horizon different from one's core view. It's also important to have the flexibility to trade against one's core view or position. Getting in the habit of seeing what is the other uh, viewpoint will make it easier to exit one's core position when the appropriate time comes. Having a predetermined exit point also helps one leave the party while the music is still playing. The most rare combination of skills must exist within the macro manager you're considering. He must be able to look out over the medium term, but he must also be sensitive, sensitive enough to nuance to manage that view daily. A lot of the managers out there are big thinker guys that cannot trade, while others are traders that can't really explain themselves. The rarity is the good macro manager who can see the medium term picture before it happens, yet has the ability to trade that idea and convert it into performance. Another important attribute of the good macro manager is breadth and knowledge of many markets around the world. Some managers who are truly only fixed income traders or relative value players or emerging market managers say they are global macro managers because they trade in some of the macro markets. As an investor, it is important that your manager has the ability to look across the globe to find the best bets and investments that have the best risk reward profiles and that are the most obvious from a fundamental perspective. In this way, although it might appear that the macro manager is spread too thin or appears to be all over the place, he really is reducing his risk by being involved in many different markets, some of which may be completely uncorrelated. For instance, right now, today, there is not a clear bet in G10 bond markets, nor, there, nor is there a clear bet in G10 equity markets, in my view. Also, the dollar has dropped a long way, and there's not a good risk-reward profile to being short the dollar, especially against the euro as it approaches the European Central Bank's 130 danger zone. Right now, our portfolio is primarily along emerging market currencies, the Brazilian real, the Russian ruble, the Mexican peso, the Korean won. In each case, the fundamentals and technicals are very positive. Inflation has been overestimated for years in these countries, and real yields are too high. In investors looking for yield pickup have been piling into the local equity and bond markets, putting upward pressure on the currency as well. The cost of carry to be along the currencies against the dollar is also enormously, enormously positive right now. Diversification into many markets is a sign that your global macro manager knows what he's doing. Concentration on one or a handful of markets probably means he isn't really a global macro manager, but rather a market-specific manager. The current environment is so full of macro opportunities that as an investor, you want your manager to be diversified. The environment for global macro should be good over the next few years for several reasons. Uh, for one, since the global output gap is still wide and measures of inflation are still declining, even as we experience high levels of GDP growth, policymakers will need to be activist. When policymakers are active, attempting to generate growth through fiscal, monetary, or currency policy, their actions can be knowable beforehand. I'm not saying that the inside word drives the macro trade, though it can, but rather that if your macro manager is doing his work, he should be able to make a fair guess at what policymakers should be doing. As each country around the world scrambles to generate growth, their policies are, in a sense, foreseeable. Norway and Switzerland, for instance, were very aggressive in using policy to stimulate growth in 2003 by actively seeking weaker currencies through low rates and central bank persuasion. The macro environment should also be good because the large U.S. current account deficit, which really is a reflection of U.S. policymakers' desire to put off an economic slowdown, inevitably results in a weaker trade with a dollar. As U.S. rates are kept low to ensure growth, the dollar depreciates against all other currencies and most against high-yielding currencies. This fact also makes non-dollar asset markets interesting, as one doesn't have to worry about local, local currency market depreciation. As capital flows into non-U.S. and emerging markets, local policymakers become active, attempting to control the effects of foreign capital inflow. Their attempts, to, their, their attempts set off another set of events that are, in a sense, also foreseeable by the good macro hedge fund manager. Despite the opportunities that are, that are now abundant in the macro world, there are risks when investing in a macro hedge fund. <coughs> Aside from the manager just being plain wrong on his outlook, mistaking what is discounted by the market, or simply trading badly, there are some inherent structural risks. 
Investing in a fund that is too large reduces the manager's ability to diversify across the globe and limits his ability to trade around core positions. It is important that the investors see that the manager has been successful in different types of environments and in different markets. Some of the large macro funds today are simply one-trade funds, funds that have been long fixed income, for instance, over the past few years. <coughs> success in one area over a certain period of time does not guarantee continued success. The way to minimize some of these risks is to find a manager that has the ability to gain and hold strong conviction in his position, but at the end of the day is flexible enough to change and perhaps even admit that the same position he held with such conviction a day ago is now completely wrong. If anyone in the audience today finds that manager, please let me know. I have a job waiting for him if he wants it. Thank you. <laughs> um, before moving on, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, Dan, uh, could you um, just maybe just compare and contrast some uh, key points uh, between some of the different macro firms that you've worked at in the past? What are some of the sort of nuggets sure. uh, that really stand out? Well, <clears throat> I think Ray uh, made the point that uh, – in the old days, it was, uh, there was a perception that there were cowboys out there taking big bets on, uh, on uh, you know, rates or currencies. Um, you know, I think that that – well, it, the nature of the, the, the investor base of these funds has changed. Uh, in the early 90s, I mean, especially I think at Tiger, uh, you know, a lot of the investors were – wealthy individuals who basically just said, look, you know, uh, go out and make me as much money as possible. And I think today, uh, you know, fund of funds have become a much bigger component. And, you know, their interest is really, you know, what, 15 to 18 uh, percent without much volatility. Mm -hmm. So the wealthy individuals, they could take the volatility because they wanted the return. But that really, I think that the, what the investors want today is different. So I think that, that that has also impacted the way money is made in, in macro markets. So some of the upside, uh, I think, has been truncated. But there's much more control of the risk now than I would say 10 years ago. Higher risk. Um, risk I think it used to be much higher risk, higher <clears throat> return. And I think it's now, you know, lower risk and, and lower return because the investor base has changed. Um, but, I mean, uh, stylistically, I mean um, – you know, each the hedge fund, I mean, in my experience, is dominated by the character personality of the person who runs it. So each hedge fund is completely different. So it's hard for me to, like, you know, go through each one. But, uh, you know, that's um, – um, I, I think I've outlined some of the things you should look for. Thanks. Um, Renee, it's a very interesting uh, approach using a sort of a value aspect uh, to trade commodities. A lot of CTAs and you know, managed futures uh, funds trade commodities with a momentum-based approach. Right. Do you think that the sort of value aspect is a superior approach or a more robust uh, approach? Yes, I mean, I absolutely do. I mean, basically what I try to do is extrapolate the really global financial trading and the commodity trading basically off, off the cash grain trading that I started out doing. Every trade, every theme is a silo. And when you're filling a silo, obviously, when you're, you know, when you're calling the hammer or calling the elevators, you have an empty silo. And you're, you're, when the silo is empty, you're paying the highest price. As you fill the silo up, you satiate your demand and buy on a scale down. Um, when you're emptying the silo, you sell on a scale, a scale up. And this is pretty opposite the CTAs who are basically um, buying and selling momentum only after the trend is confirmed. Now, you do have to do this within a, a rigorous risk management system in a systematic way, and that's what we have found with our, you know, we decide the composition and direction, but we are able to basically buy, and it's as uh, Dan said, you're, what you really want to do, it doesn't really matter what the direction is. If you buy it wrong, um, even if it goes up, we've all seen two managers be, you know, long at the same time or short at the same time, and both lose money or both make money. We want to buy at one and sell at four, and we've uh, basically utilized this system within these technical value zones, a systematic system, to buy within that range on a scale down and sell on a scale up, which is uh, uh, the value aspect rather than momentum. Thank you. Um, Ray, uh, you had said that extracting alpha is uh, sort of a zero-sum game, right? Um, if that's the case, how important is ongoing research and development in uh, sort of a systematic approach to extracting alpha, and how important is it, you know, a really sophisticated transaction methodology? 
Um, well, it, it's, the answer, I guess, is it's very important. Uh, as uh, value, added, value added being zero sum. I mean, the basic game is value added is zero sum. So you have to have an in-depth knowledge of any bet that you're making that's greater than everybody out there. So when we are all competing in our bets, we have to have that greater knowledge. We also have to have diversification. So the challenge is to have that in-depth knowledge at the same time as you're going to have a lot of different bets. And the mind can only conceive of, my mind, my simple mind is only able to think of a limited number of things. And so systemization of that process has to be essential. So I think when you, when you refer to a word, systemization, that's the word that really struck me as being the most important, that um, I need to think about my every single decision rule and have a perspective on that decision rule that encompasses all history and all time frames and be so comfortable that that is the right mean, that those are the right criteria to make a bet. But I need to have so many of those that I can simultaneously do that. And so systemization allows us to have that kind of perspective so that you can step back and you can analyze and think simultaneously with the mental process of wrestling around with questions. You can also process a lot of information. So the key is uncorrelated, lots of uncorrelated return streams that you understand with greater depth than anybody else. And I don't know how you could do it without systemization. Great. Uh, I'd like to start uh, just one general question for the, the three of you and then open up uh, the uh, Q&A portion to the general uh, members. Um, how predictable would you say the opportunity set is in global macro strategies? I mean, you know, some uh, investment strategies, um, you know, as you mentioned, merger arbitrage, you can sort of look for a beta and, you know, see the, uh, you know, kinds of deals, the quality of deals, the spreads of deals, you know. And uh, you can sort of make a jump to a conclusion uh, what you think the return streams ought to look like. So there could be some consistent expectations for predicting uh, the opportunity set. And, um, you know, maybe that changes as regimes change in bear markets and bull markets, but it's probably pretty stable. What about global macro? How predictable is the opportunity set? Um, first of all, I want to say that I think that if it's predictable, it's a problem. <laughs> okay? So that this notion, in a sense, of taking predictable return streams that, in a sense, have high correlation mean that you're not having it Z zero sum. You're not having insight. Okay, you're going to create a bet on whatever's driving that correlated return stream. So if you have a style that is of, and so you all, when you're thinking about how do you invest in invest money in the hedge funds, and you're going down that process, and you're thinking, I want a certain amount in that style, I want a certain amount in that style, and so on as styles, and you let and you and you benchmark against that styles, and you say, can I be consistent with that style? What you're then doing is making a macro bet. And so the question is, what is your talent in coming up with that structure to make that macro bet? So I think the answer should be that there shouldn't be expectations, okay? That what you want is managers who have insights and a lot of different insights. So something that I'm doing should not resemble anything that they're doing because why should our insights have any correlation? Or why should we have any bias? We shouldn't have any bias. If we do then it's like those other styles in that it's our returns are all the bias, not our insights. It's certainly not predictable uh, month to month, even though that's what most investors want. I mean, it's not realistic. Um, but, uh, and even in some cases, year to year. I mean, there, there are years where there are a tremendous number of opportunities, and there are years where there are not. So, I mean, macro, I think, historically, uh, uh, you know, has had very bunchy returns. And I think that, you know, for the most part, that should continue because it's dependent upon how many opportunities there are. See, I couldn't disagree more because <coughs> I would say um, that, that I shouldn't have any systematic bias to volatility. I shouldn't, there shouldn't be anything in an environment that, whether it's volatility, in other words, it would sort of like when I hear you say that, I sort of say, Okay, is that because the markets move a lot and so that there's a volatility bet? Or is it so that I should neutralize that volatility bet? So I shouldn't have a bias to volatility. I shouldn't have a large enough bet. 
and won any kind of trade. You're an eight billion dollar fund. You are, in a sense, a fund of funds yourself. You're not. I'm only one fund. No, but I'm the same right? thing. No, but no, but you have 15 different things you're trying to do every right. day, or 150. Right. So you are a fund of funds. You're making different bets. You know, almost. You know, not, uh, there isn't a single style or characteristic that is across your fund. I try not to have it. Right. 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 So I'm one of those 15. I understand. You see, so right. that's why for me I have less. Right. But the the advantage is, is that I don't have I don't have such bulk. Uh -huh. Right. So I mean that's a different. Uh -huh. So I, I would say then what our goal is, what our goal is in all cases, is to deliver the highest information ratio and that the diversification. I don't even know what that is. I mean, I'm sorry. Okay. In right. other words, <laughs> what, 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 what we all do is produce a certain return for a certain amount of risk. Right. Okay. And since one can, if, if I can cut my return in half, I can also choose to be more aggressive and then convert that to a higher amount of return. I have, my, my goal is the most return for a unit of risk that, I was com that I'm comfortable with. Right. So that's what I mean by information right. ratio. Right. And that what happens is if I have diversification and not a lack of bias in that, I can have a greater amount of consistency than if I had one. If you look at any one of our bets, our, let's say, return to risk ratio is about 0.35, a unit of return for standard deviation unit of risk. But if I looked at my portfolio over the last 14 years, it's had an information ratio of 1.4 only because I can have diversification of bets. That's the only thing I was trying to say in, in that. Yeah, if that you so diversification makes it more predictable. If makes the return right, and, and and you know how you measure the predictability? It's the information ratio. <laughs> if, if, to give you an idea, the probability of losing money. Um, if you want to be 80 percent sure, 85 percent sure, 85 percent sure that you won't lose money in less than three years, you have to have an information ratio of 0.9. And so, information ratio gives you the comfort is the reflection of predictability. It would be the, you know, one number that would be the measure of you know, what was my chance of losing money in any particular period. Renee, any thoughts? Well, um, basically, I guess when you're looking for a global ma macro manager, and, and that's what I always do, I mean, the way you look at your trades as well, is that I think you do want them as uncorrelated, as non-benchmark. Global macro, to me, is an absolute return strategy. And that if you are just in the swells of the rest of the global macro managers, day in, day out, year in, year out, then it isn't a, a true global macro. So I would search, continually search for those global macro managers that are uncorrelated to the global macro benchmark, per se. Yeah, thanks. At this point, I'd uh, be happy to open up the um, Q&A session to the entire members. Yes? Well, the bond guys have already lost money. Bonds rallied almost five points in the last uh, ten days, right? So I think that they, there was a zero, there was a very, very short position in January 1, and uh, they're all getting squeezed, I mean, without that much information. So I told, told you how short the market was. So you've already started to see that in the bond market, I think. Um, um, the only thing I would say is um, I wish... When everybody at sort of one, one side gets on one side, there's always a buyer and a seller. When somebody gets on one side in the consensus, there is and there are, an offside. They creates a risk that the market will continue to move that way, and that's right. If you actually sort of systematically try to structure means of measuring and testing that, you find that that's very unstable. So if you can have a move. I mean, think about gold in you know, the late 70s, uh, when take bullish consensus <coughs> figures or measures of sentiment, and everybody was universally bullish on gold for the last $500 of the move kind of thing. So it's not one of those things that's a reliable. It's not clear. How, you can't make money knowing that. You have to know enough about the issues. So when I think of, let's say, something like the dollar, here's the way I would think about the dollar. Um, <clears throat> the United States right now is... Uh, so far out of balance, just to put in perspective, that our 
imports are about twice as much as our exports, and so we're accumulating this debt, and that debt is now being owned by foreign uh, foreigners who want to, the private foreigners are wanting to sell, and so the purchases are coming down, and that there is now a need for our central banks, China and Japan, to try to maintain those, and they're filling in the void, and it's becoming uneconomic. And so today, with a current account deficit of 5.5% of GDP, which means we have to sell an amount which is about 87% of world net savings has to come to the United States on that basis, and we have an economy in which it's in the interest of the United States to be valued, that a situation like that means, I think, today, that since I don't believe that central bankers can control currencies, I mean, the track record is, is perfect, and that it is uneconomic because in China, in order to actually buy those bonds, they have to produce local currency, renminbi, in order, and that's causing a stimulation and a boom that creates a bubble. Plus, in the last two years, they've lost $50 billion in their position of holding those bonds. That I think that we've actually put ourselves in a position that it, that the fundamentals are worse than when the, when the move began, even though people are on side. And in the currencies, the currency traders represent an infinitesimally small percentage of the market because most of it is those who are purchasing and selling. We don't, we don't, we're nothing in, in that kind of environment. And so we're, I think there'll be a correction because you're in the classic, you know, okay, now the central banks are making a move that they say uh, we're going to we're going to stand against this move. And that's the first, and you get the, the, you shake out all of those people, you create that kind of a correction that shakes out all those people. But if you look at the nature of flows and all currency movements in the past, that's the exact time that you set the ingredient for the next flow because they can't back it, back it up. So the question you have to ask yourself still is what is right and what is wrong, right? You can't just be driven because somebody is on one side of the market, the consensus. It's not that simple. You know, it's a consideration, but it isn't the driving force. So you can't presume that somebody's going to be right or wrong on that basis because big moves happen, you know. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I sort of disagree a little bit because we had that we were at the same place uh, at 120 uh, earlier in the, or in the middle of last year, and we corrected down to 110 on the euro. <coughs> now, 110 was, was a great place to get in, and, you know, and some of us were fortunate enough to have gotten in at that point. But to have set through it, you know, people were max long as well at that point in the middle of last year. So, uh, and, and that did herald a 10% correction. So, I mean, for me, that's too much to sit through. I mean, I don't know, maybe for Ray, I, I don't know. The bigger picture no, I think was... It's, I think it's a good but, question, in right. other words, the mechanics of that. And I mean, so, I think it's the same place right now. We're, we're, it's, we're, we're probably, you know, we could have a 10% correction. There's certainly no one out there who thinks that we can. And, you know, for some people, that's just a bump along the way to 140 uh, in 05. But, again, I don't see it that way. Right? I think I the answer of whether that 10% correction is a problem or not from, from a management point of view depends on how many eggs you've got in that one basket. Sure, of course. Right? Right. Absolutely. So what happens is if, if you've got, you know, like for me, I'm, I'm never good enough that I could say that I, whether it's going to go down the 10% or not. And, and, and when I do, I try to put my rules together and so on. I test those criteria to see whether I can do it. And I can do it within a little bounce, but I'm just not good. So I can't set a tolerance level right. that is going to make me have to be so precise that I can tell you that it's going to right. go down. I right. do but think it will go down that do. kind of 10%. I don't think I I've ever set right. 10% in anything ever. So, so, I mean, so then you have right. to it's stylistically, again, a very different. Right. So what's essential to you is to have predictability of that sure. kind of movement. I'm on, I'm just dealing with what it is. I'm, I, you know, I'm not able to necessarily have that kind of predictability. So I have to play it. So therefore, I, the diversification means and, and leverage. I don't like hyper leverage. So the only reason a 10% move should be a big thing is because I'm so much concentrated and so leveraged in that position that I'm uncomfortable. I can't be in that position because then when you take on that leverage in that position, then you, then you, you have a bigger risk. You know what I mean? You're trading off one kind of risk to another, so I can't make the 10% so sound, move. It sounds like diversification is one of the keys to uh, avoiding some threats in an overcrowded situation. What about scaling in and out of the positions? Is that an important uh, fact? Transactions cost is critical consideration, you know. So you See, it's not for me, because mm -hmm. I'm smaller than you. Mm -hmm. So we have basically very little transaction cost. Yeah. Never comes into play in the market. There's a, there, yeah. Like, my, I don't have, um, if, if you ask dealers, they would say that we're not an interesting client because we don't have much impact. <coughs> the reason that we don't have much impact, though, is that, let me give you, you're managing, let's say, a much smaller amount, but you're much more active. Correct. I'm managing a greater amount, and the moves that I make are much more gradual. 
And so my impact on the market is literally, like, I don't even almost care whether I do it trade today on the bounce and so on, right? I, but I just have to have a lot of different uncorrelated return streams. So that's the essence of, of, of the difference. Mm. For, um, for us, also, the scaling in and out is very important, and it's more gradual, probably something in between. But I think, to your question as well, I think given the, the amount of leverage that when the momentum players jump on a move, um, both to what Dan and Ray said, supply and demand of supply and demand <coughs> now is an extremely important aspect. It's like options on optionality. Um, in fact, we used to just do all of our S&D analysis and all of our macroeconomic and micro analysis, and now a portion of that analysis is the supply and demand of the supply and demand. And in the short term, I think you're exactly right, which could, for the commodities aspect um, and the currency, I mean, I've been, I, you know, I did a survey just a couple days ago, and I, I can usually, and I've been doing this for 20 years, if you go to 10 foreign exchange dealers, and if 10 out of 10 are one way on a currency, I don't think it's ever failed that it's gone the other way. 9 out of 10 doesn't work, 8 out of 10 doesn't work, but 10 out of 10, any 10 banks, and we basically got there again the other day. Um, but if it changes in a day, then, of course, your little correction is over. Also on commodities, the, the raging, um, you know, bullish aspect of commodities, and we've been pretty bullish for, you know, two, three years, um, right now seems to be a little bit overdone where the supply and demand of supply and demand could affect a shorter-term correction. I've probably, just, just for information purposes, I've probably had about five people in the last month ask me to run a long-only commodities fund, you know, where three years ago when I would have loved to do that, um, there, was, there was zero interest. So I, uh, and I think the important part is your style, whether it's Dan's or Ray's or I'm more gradual as well and I like to scale and scale out with the value, um, is, is sticking to your style and examining just, um, you know, what these short-term aspects or what these, what these moves are, are going to do in the short term. But it doesn't change the big picture economic analysis, it's just the timing. Okay. Another question? Yes. Inflation. Still very low, but what you're saying is that extremely inflationary. Why is it so low still today, given the current environment? And how is that going to change? How are you playing with other things? Based upon what you're saying about commodities and currencies that they're Right. Well, I, I basically think it is extremely inflationary. I mean, with our current account deficit and our budget deficit, and, and um, given the, the fiscal situation that we have in the U.S., and um, um, as Dan mentioned, that you have to take 87% of, of world savings to finance our bond market, um, it's, it's really timing and demographics. And that's part of you know what I call inverse stagflation, is that um, we're in this odd situation, which is the reverse of the early 80s, where, where the early 80s, there was massive borrowing, and now the demographics of the whole world is, um, you know, basically in this massive savings situation. And so until, and with the, the aging population, that whole bulge of the demographics is seeking yield. Um, and I think the low interest rate environment can be, I mean, it's productivity gains, it's a number of things, it's the deflationary aspects, but on top of it, Money is like grain of the 80s, at a price it can be had. And so, um, for me, you know, the elevators that had 10 years of government supplies of grains, now we've got those elevators and silos of money all around the world. Um, so for me, the interest rate scenario is going to affect the shape of the yield curve probably more than an absolute um, spike in the yield curves. And it's which area, and to me that's, that's clearly the long end, um, because the weight of money still before the, the global population is in retirement and that dis-saving, that weight of money, well, and this is particular, the caveat is if um, equity markets keep going up, um, then that weight of money isn't going to be as, as dramatic. But if the equity market's sideways to down for the next five or ten years, then that mid-area of the curve could have an extremely, you know, it, it could be rates capped under the rate of inflation, in which case tips would be one fantastic because you're going to have interest rates really stay stable so your absolute price 
um, you know, you're not going to lose money on your on your principal, and then you're going to gain the um, the inflation adjusted aspect um, there. But I, I would look for the yield curve to change and possibly to get in a V with the short term rates coming up if inflation does feed through, and the longer term risks um, of, of longer term rates going up. I mean, that's my perspective. Yeah, on, on a five year view, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to have any inflation. Um, you know, we, all the major readings are still dropping. And that's after an 8% quarter and it'll, in the third quarter, and it'll be a 5% quarter in Q4, and who knows what the first half will be. So, I mean, it, not necess- that, that isn't to say that there's a tight, you know, fit between growth and inflation. At some point, there should be. But, you know, what would have happened to those inflation readings had we had only 2 or 3% growth? So, you know, all the supply is still out there. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think the move in the commodities is... Uh, <coughs> You know, more reflection of the dollar drop. I mean, copper and euro is not up as much, uh, you know, as uh, all of these commodities are dollar based. So that's a, you know, the, I mean, I don't think yet that there's any sort of inflationary pass through. We certainly haven't seen the data either. Um, you want to, you were going to interrupt me? No, go ahead. No, no I didn't mean to. Uh, sorry. So, um, you know, I think that, look, a lot of the growth, a lot of the uh, activity we're seeing now also comes about from what I would call, you know, one-off stimulus uh, from uh, Q2 uh, after the war. We had, you know, very low rates, and that sparked the refi boom. We had, um, you know, the fiscal kick. We had the dollar dropping, and we're sort of, we hit the meat part of that decline. Um, um, uh, so I, I don't know necessarily that all those things continue for three years. I think that you know, there are also, you know, a lot of this activity was, was uh, politically motivated in front of the election. I think that probably falls away at some point. I mean, the impact of those stimuli fall away. Um, and, I mean, I think 05 is going to be a very weak year. I think there's a chance the 10 year here, you know, in the next five years is going the other way. I mean, could, you know, get below 3%. So. That's on a very big picture view. It may not have any relevance to actually making money, but I mean, I can see the other scenario that these things are one-offs, and also the stock market, uh, in euro terms, hasn't done anything. So the, the stock market rally really just reflected the dollar drop. People here are not as wealthy; they just don't realize it, <laughs> right? That's why the administration is doing it; is not caring about how much the dollar drops. I just want to give a. a, 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 a somewhat similar, but also a somewhat different view. I think that from, like, the supply of stuff, there's a lot of deflationary pressure, partially because of productivity and partially because of China and the emergence. The population of China <coughs> is twice that of the United States and, and Europe combined, and its per capita income is 120th ours. And uh, if you go there and spend time, you see how they are effective competitors. And they're not just competitive because you move goods back and forth. In the Internet era, they're both in lots of different ways. And so we have that problem. And then, not problem, the benefit of you can produce a lot of goods cheaper, not only because of that. 61 cents, but right, for product. average hourly earnings versus $15 here? No, is it's, it's, it? it's $950 per year, in, in a sense. Okay, and they, and they will, anyway. So you have... From a, because of productivity around the world and because of um, China and so on, the stuff part of it is deflationary and, and has been for a while. In other words, inflation pressures have gone down since 1980. The other part of that is there's a lot of debt. And when you accumulate debt, the, the demand for currency and so on, in a sense, is a deflationary force. Those things existed. But we've been able to deal with those things by lowering interest rates all the time. So lowering interest rates alleviates deflation, but you've come to zero, you've come to one, okay? So you've had this big movement down to one. And now, if you look at, um, so there's a need to reflate, okay? Because you can't have, if you, if you say what, ha- what would have happened if you didn't have that movement down, then you would have had a deflationary environment, environment similar to Japan so that you needed to lower that. So now you're at this position. And when you think about, okay, how would you get it to a 9% expected return at a pension fund someplace like that? How do you get there? You can't get there with the current level of inflation and so on. So the issue is the United States is like, in a sense, an element of a Brazil or some other country, and that has it's too much debt. It's been required too much in capital. And so and other countries need to reflate in order to compete with countries like China. Take China, when you think, it, not it a perversity 
that the renminbi, their currency, has devalued by 40% against Europe. Isn't, so f- Europe in price has gone up by 40% <laughs> against China. I mean, so there's something way out of kilter. So that there are both the need, there are the secular deflation pressure that's coming down that can't any more longer be dealt with with cutting interest rates, and there's the need to reflate, and those two things are coming together, and how they play out, we don't know exactly, but those are coming together, and you, you know, so who's smart enough to say how exactly they'll play out? We have to see, but those are the fortunes. So we're coming, I think, in the next, in the next, in 2005, I think will be an interesting year, because there's plenty of slack in the economy, and the usual things that produce inflation, even the dollar depreciation and import inflation is not happening. So there's not an inflation question now, I don't think. But you start to get to 2005 or late 2005 and so on, past the elections and so on, you have issues that will be interesting. Those would be the periods I think that things will be more. So I think it's easier to say that there's the need to reflate and produce dollars to service the debt, to get the, more, the United States more competitive and so on. But you can't say that that's inflationary at this stage because you've got the other forces. Thanks. Um, I'm pretty sure there are as many questions uh, for you guys as there are people in the room right now. Um, But unfortunately, I think we've run out of time for our session, so I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, What what seems kind of interesting to me, I guess just in summary, is uh, that you three have built very different mousetraps, yet they're all quite successful in their own way, I think. Um, And I think that's kind of a fascinating uh, aspect of global macro. Um, I'd like to thank Steve McMinniman and the programming committee uh, for the privilege of moderating this excellent panel. I'll hand it back to you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, we really appreciate your um, preparation for this. And we went through, all of you, um, we went, gosh, we had a list of about 45 managers. And mm-hmm. you're seeing the, uh, the final cut. We, Bill, selected this panel for its diversity. Um, I want to thank all of you for braving the snowstorm. Um, just simply, a couple of us went and came here from quite a far ways. Uh, a real welcome. A real came to us from Norway. <laughs> Ivan, you were there. used to the snow. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Ivan. You and your colleagues from France, welcome. Braving through the snowstorm. And Florent, where are you? Oh, from Montreal. That's right. So. <laughs> Those of you who didn't make it from New York, wherever you are, you had no <laughs> excuse, none. And those of you who live in town, I know, we know why you're here, because the schools are closed and you want to get out of the house. <laughs> so welcome and thank you. Um, you know, we, we have some people here who make this all possible. And um, one of them is here today. Um, Kevin Mirabile, would you uh, give us... And you all remember um, his talk a little while ago. Kevin has broken ranks uh, with the prime brokerage community and and is telling us quite openly and quite um, systematically about the risks of the back office. Can you give us a little update um, on on OLC risk and all that sort of thing? I'll keep this very brief because like three of the four football games this weekend, we've seemed to have gone into overtime. And, uh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, the quality of the – roundtable, uh, audience participation, uh, the speaker panels, and some of the uh, subcommittees uh, is very important to Barclays and, and helps us shape some of our strategies uh, and some of the services that we want to bring to uh, the community, whether it be the fund of funds uh, or the hedge funds that, that are active or the direct investors. And I uh, just want to thank everyone for coming out uh, in this uh, weather and from these uh, distances. This is our third year sponsoring uh, the roundtable, and it is uh, important to us because of the quality of everyone's participation. So, again, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, February 12th, we'll meet here again, and um, thanks, everyone. Thank you, speakers.